Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And what you see on your screen before you is the image of an anime voice actor by the name of Rachel Messer, who is discussing in this video something that she frames as the Susie Lou issue. Now, if that name doesn't mean anything to you, I can't blame you. It didn't mean anything to me as of a couple of days, maybe a week or so ago. But Susie Lou is a fellow YouTube content creator that presently is in the business of making anime reaction videos. Reactions of her responding to an anime episode or episodes that she is watching. Now, if you watch this video, and I highly recommend it, Rachel Messer does this video, did a follow-up video about what is happening, what she frames as the Suzy Lou issue, primarily as I understand it, because this particular YouTuber wound up issuing DMCA takedown notices to anybody that was critical of what she was doing. And maybe not anybody, but at least a lot of people that were critical of what she is doing. And because of that, her name became part of the forefront of YouTube drama. A lot of people started discussing it. And Ms. Messer here was in my Twitch feed, I don't know exactly why, but was discussing DMCA takedowns, the nature of copyright, exactly what anime companies can do to protect it. And I wound up responding to her with a video that I had done a few months ago about the nature of video game streaming and how, while most people don't think of it this way, the copyright holder of a video game doesn't have to let you stream their video game. That's clearly a derivative work, and we're going to talk about copyright law in general in this video in case you aren't familiar with it, but it's clearly a derivative work. And if they wanted to take your channel down, if they wanted to strike it, do other things, they absolutely could. But so many don't do that because it's seen as good advertising for the game that these streams, these channels live at what I generally frame as the largesse of the copyright holder. They allow the infringement because it is useful to them. So I led Ms. Messer to this video, said, hey, check this out. This might be useful for your follow-up video. And she wound up saying the following. I would love to see Hoag Law cover the anime reactions, Susie Liu, and the striking of channels. This video really doubles over for most of it, but I would value his input on this section directly. So I said, okay, I'll take a look at that. I went into a couple of her Twitch streams. We discussed some DMCA takedown things. And ultimately, she wound up following up her original video with a video that included significant sections from that streaming video, the discussion that I wound up having about this largesse concept, what copyright infringement is, and also kind of gave a brief description of how I would see the four factors of fair use play out with respect to Ms. Liu. So I wanted to take a chance in this video to just kind of elaborate on a few of those things. If you've been in virtual legality for a long time, you know that we have discussed these things in the past. Very recently, we discussed the nature of DMCA takedown abuse with respect to Sony and or Naughty Dog and Musso Limited and what they are doing to try to quash discussion of the leaks surrounding The Last of Us Part Two, which is really kind of what got my ire up, what certainly got my attention. Because the DMCA, and I know a lot of people disagree with this because they come into my comments, I do think is a useful concept in the law to have these platforms get some kind of safe harbor for what all these third parties are putting on them. But that doesn't mean that I think it's perfect, and it certainly is open to these kinds of abuses. So if you've got somebody like a Susie Liu that is out there doing whatever she's doing, and I don't want to call out any specific channel on this, but Susie Liu was brought to my attention both from Ms. Messer and also months ago, really, in the comments to my own videos asking me to address what's happening here, that if she is in fact going out and doing the same kind of DMCA abuses, it's worthwhile as a jumping off point to discuss the nature of reaction channels and why they should probably be the last people on earth to start issuing DMCA takedown notices on other people's videos. Now, with that as background, I want to take one frame here which is obviously not a substantial amount of her video, is not a market substitute for you checking out her video, and will all consist of critique, substantive enough to qualify as transformative under fair use, should she elect to be viewing this and deciding whether or not to issue a takedown or copyright strike on this video. But this is what she does. I took a look at a few of these. Uh, Ms. Messer sent me a link to a couple of these. And like a lot of other channels on YouTube, she plays a episode of anime in the corner 
and she reacts to it. You can see it here. Uh, she says things like, oh, so many knives, or oh, this is making me so sad. Oh, no, don't do that, etc., etc., etc. And as we've talked about in the past, there's a couple of things we can say just at the front end of this. Ms. Lu doesn't own this image, doesn't own this video, doesn't own this audio. Someone else does, is a copyright owner. And that someone else can be the Japanese company that created it, can be the United States company that's licensing it, depending on what she's looking at. But we can all agree she doesn't own this. And if we take that as the assumption, that means that if we don't fall into another area of the law, it is copyright infringement. As we've talked about, and we're going to use U.S. law for this purpose, other jurisdictional laws might apply, but a lot of them are going to mirror this baseline concept of the bundle of rights you get when you're a copyright holder. You made Naruto, or whatever kind of sub-series she's watching in the Naruto universe for purposes of this discussion. You made it, and so the law says you get these exclusive rights. You're the only one that can do these things. You're the only one that can reproduce it. You're the only one that can make derivative works based on it. You're the only one that can distribute it, perform it publicly. Those are the only things you are allowed to do if you own the thing, right? You are the copyright owner. It's exclusive to you. You can do a lot of other things with it. I misspoke just now, but you, these are exclusive to you to do with the property that you have. And you say, Rick, I see a lot of other people doing other things with this stuff. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One, as we talked about earlier in the video, the copyright owner doesn't have to police its copyright. A lot of people get this confused. Trademark owners have to be a little bit more policing of their trademark, but trademark is distinct from copyright. Trademark is a label that shows the source of something. Copyright is the actual intellectual property of what that something is. It's the script, it's the pictures, it's the audio, it's everything that makes up that expression of an idea. It's the episode in its entirety for this purpose. Trademark would be something like the name Naruto. And so the copyright holder doesn't have to take anything down that it doesn't want to take down, but it reserves the right to do so because it is the only one allowed to make derivative works. So if we go back and we look at this, we see that this reactions to an episode of a TV show are going to be derivative works of that TV show. So we have a copyright infringement if you don't fall under some specific exemption from copyright infringement law. Now, note a couple of things here. One, if she wasn't showing the image here, if she was just showing a video of herself and said, start the episode that you own otherwise at the same time, you've got a much more difficult case to make if you're the copyright owner. Note that I didn't say impossible. Timer type items are probably fair use, might not even be copyright usage, but a clever lawyer could argue that they're derivative works in the purest sense, right? You're clearly responding to something else. The reactions don't make any sense at all if that other thing doesn't exist. And so from a kind of definitional standpoint, it is a kind of derivative. But in my best estimate, the law is going to not come down as harshly on those that are just the timer-based videos that aren't including actual copyrighted material in the image that they are reacting to. But that's not what Ms. Liu is doing here. Instead, she's putting the images here. She is editing certain things around them, but her commentary is mostly consisting of exclamations. Oh no, that's a lot of knives, etc., etc. So she wants to find herself in the limitations on exclusive rights section, what we generally see in the world of YouTube as fair use. And we say it as follows. Notwithstanding the provisions of sections 106 and 106A, that says, notwithstanding all these exclusive rights that we just talked about, the fair use of a copyrighted work, including such use by reproduction in copies, or just to show you how good the Copyright Act is at being modern, phono records, or by any other means specified by that section for purposes such as, not, but not limited to is the best way to read this, criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research is not an infringement of copyright, which is great. That's what so many YouTubers rely on. That's what I rely on in commenting on the news articles or the video clips that I comment on and give legal analysis or business analysis on. I rely on fair use like so many other people do. In determining whether the use made of a work in any particular case is a fair use, the factors to be considered shall include purpose, nature, amount, and effect on the market. 
And I think if you've gone over this, if you've listened to discussions about these kinds of items, you're familiar with those four factors. But as a lawyer, it's now important for me to say to you, those factors are really amorphous. They are really vague and they allow the court that would be interpreting the application of the fair use rule here, 17 USC 107, a wide, wide level of discretion as to whether or not fair use should apply in a given case. What's the purpose? What's the nature? Is this amount enough? Is it not enough? What could be the effect? If you think about what is the effect of the use upon the potential market, you can understand it's entirely hypothetical. It's the court, the judge, maybe a panel of judges deciding on their own what they think the effect of the use will be based on their judgment, sure, but not generally based on actual data that they can use because you can't have an alternate universe that establishes what the market would look like without this thing in it or involved in it or adjacent to it. So all of this stuff is what we might call an equitable kind of doctrine. It's a balancing test of all these things. So you can go, okay, for the video creator, for the copyright holder, for the video creator, for the copyright holder. And then how do we balance it? Who knows? And every single time it depends on the facts and circumstances of the issue. That's why, and I might wind up doing a video of this in virtual legality as well, making a class action lawsuit on DMCA abuse is so difficult because the fundamental nature of a class action is that all of you in the class have to be substantially in the same position. And when we talk about a DMCA takedown or any copyright infringement claim, it's all based on the facts and circumstances of the actual material that would be before the court. So it's very difficult to see a class being certified on that basis unless you've got a clever attorney and some facts that really match up across everybody that wants to be certified as that class. But that's the nature of fair use, right? And we talked about this. We went through the four factors in a similar kind of context in our video about MXR plays, where they got what they deemed to be an extortion letter from a company called Jukin Media about their use of, and I had analyzed, a volcano clip in which they said, oh, wow, in the middle of the volcano explosion. And that was essentially it in respective commentary. And I went through and I looked at it and I said, well, there are certain reasons to believe that they might fall under fair use, but they probably walked over the line here. And when you talk about taking a creative work and not just a kind of news clip of a volcano erupting, you have a worse case than MXR plays. And so when we talk about people reacting to actual creative media, movies, television, anime, whatever it might be, fair use becomes all the more difficult to achieve. Or as the copyright office, it says, winds up saying about fair use, fair use is a legal doctrine that promotes freedom of expression by permitting the unlicensed use of copyright protected works in certain circumstances. Section 107 calls for consideration of the following four factors in evaluating a question of fair use. And these are the four factors that we just wound up talking about. The first is purpose. And you'll see here that the Copyright Office is actually going to start talking about what courts do here. This is important, right? The Copyright Office, you might think, is the perfect place to go to get the exact information you need to know whether you fall under fair use. But just like in virtual legality, not even the U.S. Copyright Office can promise you how these things will be interpreted. They actually frame it as follows. Courts look at how the party claiming fair use is using the copyrighted work and are more likely to find that nonprofit educational and non-commercial uses are fair. Obviously, that's not an issue here. This is a commercial use on a monetized YouTube channel. It's not educational as much as I might love to think that just random exclamations about anime videos are educational. They're not. This continues by saying additionally, transformative uses are more likely to be considered fair. And transformative uses are those that add something new with a further purpose or different character and do not substitute for the original use of the work. Now, note. This is, again, just an interpretation on a blog post by the Copyright Office, and they're making certain assumptions about how the court sees things. Even in this last sentence, they wind up kind of mixing in factor four into factor one in a way that the court probably wouldn't do. But a lot of courts are going to look at these things very, very differently. The nature of the copyrighted work, using a more creative or imaginative work, such as a novel, movie, or song, is less likely to support a claim of fair use than using a factual work, what we just talked about. You've got a better case for using that video of a volcano eruption than you do about using a novel movie song or Naruto episode. The amount that you use. If the use includes a large portion of the copyrighted work, fair use is less likely to be found. If the use employs only a small amount of copyrighted material, fair use is more likely. And in other contexts, 
using even a small amount of a copyrighted work was determined not to be fair because the, sel the selection was an important part or the heart of the work. We talked about that with respect to MXR Plays and the Juke and Media claim, which was that the Volcano video was longer than they used, but they used the explosion, which other than being a video looking at a dormant mountain was all that was needed in order to be the heart of the work. So in my opinion, they probably did walk over the fair use line for what they were doing with their commentary. Finally, as we said, the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. Here, courts review whether and to what extent the unlicensed use harms the existing or future market for the copyright owner's original work, for example, by displacing sales of the original. Now, as we'll see, I've got one case I want to bring up here. It's not just for example, usually, by displacing sales of the original. Mostly the fourth factor has been interpreted to mean, does this substitute in the market for that video? It doesn't mean, for instance, that, hey, if your new video is immensely critical of the other video, you lose this factor because that will harm the original video's market. You are allowed to critique the original video or whatever other content you are otherwise critiquing. It's about substitution, not just whether you are positive or negative about the original work. Looking at a specific case that I wanted to bring up that maybe you are familiar with if you're in the YouTube space, this is Hazen Zeta versus Klein, a pretty famous YouTube styled case that was about this specific issue in a way where they found fair use, not reactions. And we're going to see a footnote that is very important to this discussion, but YouTube videos in general, videos like this one, where we talk about another YouTuber and critique what it is that they are doing. It says this action principally concerns whether critical commentary on a creative video posted on YouTube constitutes copyright infringement. Matt Hazenzeda filed this action in response to a video created by Ethan and Gila Klein and in which they comment on and criticize plaintiff's copyrighted video. The Klein's criticism and commentary is interwoven with clips from the Haas video. The operative complaint alleges that defendants infringed plaintiff's copyrights, made misrepresentations in a counter takedown notice in violation of the DMCA, and defamed the plaintiff. The key evidence in the record consists of the Klein and Haas videos themselves. Any review of the Klein video leaves no doubt that it constitutes critical commentary of the Haas video. There is also no doubt that the Klein video is decidedly not a market substitute for the Haas video. For these and other reasons, as set forth below, Defendant's use of clips from the Haas video constitutes fair use. So this is a finding about a YouTuber that got a fair use decision in court because of what they did in their video. And we have a description here. The Klein video opens with commentary and discussion between Ethan and Gila Klein, followed by segments of the Haas video, which they play, stop, and continue to comment on and criticize. The Klein video, which is almost 14 minutes long, intersperses relatively short segments of the Haas video with long segments of the Klein's commentary, ultimately using three minutes and 15 seconds of the five minute, 24 second long Haas video. So a good portion of the Haas video wound up being used. Now here's that footnote I wanted to talk about when we talk about the law's problem with reactions. The Klein video is arguably part of a large genre of YouTube videos commonly known as reaction videos. Videos within this genre vary widely in terms of purpose, structure, and the extent to which they rely on potentially copyrighted material. Some reaction videos, like the Klein video, intersperse short segments of another's work with criticism and commentary, while others are more akin to a group viewing session without commentary. Accordingly, the court is not ruling here that all reaction videos constitute fair use. Now, if you've ever been to law school, one of the fun little things that I always remember my professors teaching me is that some of the best kind of legal arguments and most interesting things that the courts are thinking about are included in the footnotes to the cases. It's clear by the way this footnote is structured. They want to make clear that while they are finding fair use here, the things that are akin to a group viewing session do not get that same kind of treatment. That no court that might otherwise use this decision as precedent or off which to base their own decision should deem this to mean that everything that is a reaction is fair use. In fact, the only reason to include this footnote is to make sure that isn't the case, which implies as a lawyer that the court thinks that those things that are akin to a group viewing session are not fair use. It's not the way this is judged because that's not what before that's not what is before the court in this particular case, but it is implied by the use of this footnote. 
And that makes sense, right? When we talk about Suzy Lou or any number of other reaction channels, you wind up in a place where they probably don't meet all these fair use criteria. Say no single factor is categorically determinative in this open-ended and context-sensitive inquiry. Although no factor is determinative, the heart of the fair use inquiry is the first factor, whether the use is transformative by adding something new with a further purpose or different character. Now note, if you are following virtual legality, you'll note that in our Last of Us leak legalities discussion, we looked at a different court case back in 1987 that said the fourth factor was the most important. That should give you some flavor as to how amorphous and vague this is and how, depending on the court you're before or even the judge within that court that you are before, the entire analysis could change. So when I talk about these kinds of things, when we look at something like Suzy Lou or any other YouTuber reaction channel, we always have to give the caveat. It's all based on facts and circumstances. And I might see it one way. The lawyer next to me might see it another way. The judge, the most important, might see it a third way. And so we can't give legal opinions on these things, at least not so well, because while we can see the things that are really clearly jumping over various lines, any given court might find it a different way. It says, it is well established that among the best recognized justifications for copying from another's work is to provide comment on it or criticism of it. That's the first factor. The second factor, which this court says is rarely found to be determinative, calls for recognition that some works are closer to the core of intended copyright protection than others. In other words, copyright is designed to encourage the creation of artistic works. So if you've got an artistic work, you're more likely to lose a fair use argument if you are critiquing an artistic work because that artistic work is itself entitled to copyright protection more than a factual work. Thus, a determination that an allegedly infringed work is fictional or creative weighs against a finding of fair use. The third factor is amount and substantiality. Finally, the fourth factor focuses on whether the secondary use usurps demand for the protected work by serving as a market substitute. Note what the court says here, which we discussed previously in respect to the Copyright Office's complaint. The question is whether the allegedly infringing work serves as a market substitute for the allegedly infringing work, not merely whether the market for the allegedly infringed work was harmed. The fundamental question is substitution, not just whether you are so good at your rhetoric. You're such a powerful arguer that merely having your video out there could destroy the market for something else because you have exemplified all the negatives in whatever that other thing was. It's not about that. It's about whether your video substitutes for the previous video. And then we skip a few things here. They talk about DMCA abuse and defamation. And then we get to them deciding that this was fair use. The Klein video is quintessential criticism and comment. It says Ethan Klein remarks that the bold guy comes from an older days of YouTube and the king of cringe tube. Ethan mocks the video's opening title and mimics the movement of the words by performing a dance. After watching what they apparently consider a lewd and unrealistic opening sequence, they point out that plaintiff wrote the script and comment on that writing. They talk about the way that the defendant is dressed and all these various other things that are legitimate critiques of the content. Now, the court wants to say, hey, they aren't backing up what the clients had to say, irrespective of whether one finds it necessary, accurate, or well executed. The Klein video is nonetheless criticism and commentary on the Haas video. Important to note, the courts aren't in the business of deciding that your argument is a good one. It's in the business of deciding whether you made one at all, whether you had critique or commentary or transformed it in some way. Now, I know reaction channel fans want to say, I wouldn't even be watching this if I couldn't see these reactions. And that's fair, but it doesn't end this conversation. It actually has to be transformative under the law, not just because you like to see the reactions in question. The second factor, the court actually says, goes towards the original copyright holder, the original video maker here, because it was creative in nature. And it doesn't matter that they wrote it themselves. The court finds that argument to be a loser. And so they actually say the second factor finds against fair use. Then talking about the quantity used, the defendant tries to say, hey, three and a half minutes out of five some odd minutes, that's a lot. But the court says, hey, when you're critiquing something, it matters that you need to be able to use what it is that you want to critique. They say here, the extent and quality and importance of the video clips used by defendants were reasonable to accomplish the transformative purpose of critical commentary. You use what you need. So in an anime reaction video, if you cut out everything that wasn't a substantive critique, maybe you could use this just fine under fair use. 
But if you've got long sequences of silence, if you've got sequences that consist of, oh no, that's so many knives or other kind of just observations, that's not going to rise to the level of legal protection. If you want to do this, and I do think there's a market for people that want to have their favorite content creators, their favorite personalities respond to things that they like or maybe things that they hate, then you have to go through the effort of editing out the things that aren't critique, that aren't effective commentary. Because when we talk about the substantiality test, it needs to be reasonably related to the transformative purpose. So even if we give you, okay, there's some critique here, you can only use or should only be using that amount of the content that specifically relates to the allowed use, the actual critique, the transformative use. And when you go above that, you've got a problem, especially when you get to the fourth factor, substantiality of the effect on the market, right? In this particular item, the court says this is very clearly not a substitute on the market because this is a parody slash satire slash very critical commentary. Nobody would go to this video instead of the first video to get the same kind of effect as the first video. So the court says, taking all that into account, we balance all this stuff and we determine that fair use is where we come out. But as you can see, it's very facts and circumstances based. It's very much open to interpretation by any given lawyer, any given judge, and anybody can issue a cease and desist letter. Anybody can issue a DMCA takedown. And so when you've got a case like this, you've got someone like Ms. Liu here actually issuing takedowns to other channels for use of clips from her videos. You get into a position where you say, yeah, that's probably DMCA abuse because you can absolutely critique somebody else's work just as we just saw in that case. But under the DMCA takedown structure, as we've talked about with respect to Sony and other abuses, there's a large amount of leeway where if you can craft any kind of argument that the use shouldn't fall under fair use, then maybe you can win that takedown notice. Or more importantly, you can win the fact that you don't owe damages for issuing the takedown notice because the standard in the DMCA is set so highly that you have to be knowingly and materially misrepresenting the position in order to get into any trouble for issuing a takedown notice at all, that while I think this is abuse, while I think this is an important kind of discussion to be had about reaction channels, not at all limited to Susie Liu or MXR Plays or how Juke and Media is enforcing things or Sony or anyone else, I think it's a very important conversation about YouTube in general. It's not one that the law is specifically set up right now to allow. What Susie Liu is doing here, in my opinion, won't fall under fair use, right? Certainly the things where she doesn't use images, where she gives an introduction, where she gives an extra, whatever that might be, that's not copyright infringement. But the actual content here of putting up major portions of an anime, you know, 75% of an anime episode, having interjections that mostly are limited to, oh no, that's so many knives, etc., aren't going to get you to a place where it's transformative, aren't going to get you to a place where it's critique or commentary, it's a creative work. You're going to lose factor one. You're going to lose factor two. The substantiality test, you're going to fail. Presumably, you're going to actually be reacting to the heart of the episode either way. But at 75%, you're going to lose factor three. And if you put it in order, chronological order, and you don't edit out major parts of how the story functions, then I think a court's going to be able to find, yeah, somebody could just watch this episode that they might otherwise have to pay for, that somebody else is licensing the rights to distribute. And they could just watch your video in lieu of watching the original and get the same kind of sensation, get the same kind of narrative flow. And in that situation, what you've got is a loss in factor one, in factor two, in factor three, in factor four, it ceases to become a balancing test and starts to be an execution. And I don't say that because I don't understand that a lot of people love these videos. Absolutely love these videos. If you want to ask for reform on the Copyright Act and the law and say, Something like this should be allowed. If you want to have some kind of mechanical statutory license in which if these YouTubers agree to a certain amount of money, going back to the copyright holder, they're allowed to do these kinds of things with certain rules and regulations, absolutely advocate for those things. My job in virtual legality is to tell you what isn't allowed right now. And in my opinion, you have to act within the ambit of the law. You have to go ask for that reform if you want it. Now, I don't know whether you'd win that day. Certainly, copyright holders are going to be disinclined to allow that kind of thing, but it's at least possible. The right way to do it isn't just to add an opacity filter 
onto the video image that you're putting up to avoid content ID on the YouTube side of things. That doesn't make it less infringing. It just makes you less likely to be caught by the robots that operate YouTube. So at the end of the day, if you're familiar with virtual legality, you know, we don't get invested in YouTube drama. We don't try to single out these various videos. In fact, that was the initial response that I had to one of the commenters that had asked me about Ms. Liu in the first instance. But enough people wound up coming to me, enough people wound up asking about this specific kind of reaction channel that I wanted to at least put out there what a lawyer's thought process is when they look at these kinds of things. And a clever lawyer could say, hey, maybe there is critique there. Maybe it is enough. Maybe it is transformative. Maybe you can give me a light win on factor one. And maybe I can argue that the editing is substantial enough to get me out of factor four as well. And we can just balance against two and three. But I think that's probably a losing argument. And I think most people that are operating these reaction channels know that. The unfortunate truth about all of this stuff is that these infringements do live at the largesse of the companies. And one of the things that happens is if you get big enough, if you get popular enough, if you get enough of an audience, these companies actually have to start looking at you a little bit differently. Because if they wind up striking you, if they wind up taking a negative action against you, that can absolutely spin back around on them, even if they're fully within their rights. And I think that's an important note here, that when you've got the question, how can so many of these people be allowed to do these things? The bigger you are, the harder it is for that company to actually act against you because you can wield that audience, wield a potential outrage mob against them. And if you're in the middle ground, if you're 10,000 subscribers or just, uh, just under at Hoaglaw, or if you're 100,000 subscribers even, they can probably wheel around against you. But you start getting up above a quarter of a million, certainly half a million, more than a million, the company really has to think about what they want to do against you because yes, it's affecting their market, but maybe, maybe it's advertising, maybe it's a positive effect, and maybe taking any kind of action would wind up boomeranging around on them in a way that they really, really don't want. That's been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, please subscribe. Please check out the episodes from Ms. Mesner that I talked about earlier in this video because she does talk about this concept from the perspective of an actual voice actor that is giving her voice to these anime videos and how she feels about the overall economics of what's happening. Highly recommend it from that perspective, a perspective I cannot give you. Otherwise, we are talking about these kinds of things in virtual legality all the time. We obviously talked about The Last of Us leaks a lot. I think we've got six episodes in that sequence. If you're interested in that story at all, we cover it from a number of different angles. And we are generally talking about movies, pop culture, TV, media, all through the lens of business and law so that hopefully you can understand and better appreciate what's happening in the news items around you for the pop culture and other content that you love. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it in its podcast form, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel. Oh,